Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, I trust that you are reading your Bible every day. If I could go back to the very beginning of my journey, which would be back in the 70s, I can tell you that the one principle that was not laid down for me, nor is laid down for many of God's people, the number one duty, the most important thing that we can do as his people is to read his word. Now, even though I read his word as an early Christian, and I'm sure that you did too, I did not read it in the way that it should be read. And I cannot emphasize enough the importance of reading five chapters of the New Testament every day. I cannot emphasize enough of reading five chapters of the Bible of the New Testament every single day. I cannot tell you how important it is to your Christian life, to your spiritual well-being, to your growth in the Lord Jesus. And it is the most neglected Christian duty among the Christian people, and yet it is the most crucial. Well, today is November the 16th in the year of our Lord, 2017, and this is one a day for the soul. Now, we are continuing our study in the book of Hebrews, and we are beginning chapter 3 today. So let us begin reading in verse 1, and we'll discuss as we go along. Wherefore, holy brethren, now note, this is to the Christian individual, the follower of the Lord Jesus, because he calls them holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Consider him, friend. Stop for a moment and think about what he has done, how he lived, how he died, how he was resurrected, how he sent back his Holy Spirit, and what the purpose in all of that was for you as his follower. You see, in verse 2, he was faithful to him, to the Father that appointed him, as was Moses, who was faithful in his house. But this man, Jesus, was counted more worthy and of more glory than Moses, now, you got to be reading this as a Jewish person with a Jewish mindset because Moses was the most important figure in all of Jewishdom, in all of Jewish history. He's the one that brought the law. And yet the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus is more worthy than Moses. And so this would make the reader of this letter stop and really begin to question who this man Jesus was, who he is. And that's why the writer of Hebrews laid such a foundation in chapter 1 of who Jesus is. He continues saying, Inasmuch as he who has built the house hath much more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. Now we know from Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 that Jesus is the one who's created all things. And so here in verse 4, there is another identifying factor that Jesus is God. He is Theos. He is the Almighty. Now Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son, Moses was a servant, Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are if capital I-F, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Well, what if we don't hold fast firm unto the end? Then we are not his house. We do not belong to him. And that's why he says in verse 11, I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest, into my dwelling, into my house. Wherefore, verse 7, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Now, he's referring back to the people in the wilderness in the days of Moses. He says, it was then when your fathers tempted me. They proved me. 
They saw my works for 40 years, but I was grieved with that generation because they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest or my dwelling. Now he says in verse 12, take heed. Why would we take heed? Why would we beware? Why would we be cautious if there wasn't something to lose? And so he says, take heed, brethren. Again, an indication he's writing to the believer, the follower of the Lord Jesus. Take heed lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And don't just be focused upon your own departure from the Lord, but exhort one another daily, encourage one another daily, warn one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now that's an interesting way of putting it, the deceitfulness of sin. Well, the reason it's deceitful is because we can be deceived by it. It almost goes back to what Isaiah said. They're going to call evil good and good evil. Why? Because they've been deceived by sin. Now stop and consider your life for a moment, your choices, the things that you participate in. Have you been deceived by them? Do they appear good and yet they are evil? We wrap up many of these things in a gift box and call it Christianity, but what lies within is evil. It's pagan. It does not glorify the Lord Jesus. But we think because we have Christianized it that it's okay. But if it's evil in its roots, everything that it produces will be evil. And so he's warning us here not to be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Examine everything very closely. And if there is any hint of the fingerprints of Satan upon it, we should flee from it. Why? In verse 14, because we are made partakers of Jesus Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Again, there is a big if there. Now, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, as in the days when the Israelites traveled through the wilderness for 40 years and grumbled and complained against God who was providing for them with such care. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned? whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. Do you recall in Numbers chapter 11, verse 5, it says the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. Now this is alluding to the people that came out of Egypt with the children of Israel. Many of these were Egyptians. And they, by what they saw through the ten plagues, realized that the living God, Jehovah, was Almighty God, and even the gods that they worshipped in Egypt must bow to Jehovah. And they forsake the gods of Egypt, and they go with Moses because they want to serve the true and living God. And it says, Then the children of Israel wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? But notice verse 5. We remember the fish, which we did eat, in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. Now these are foods which are pleasurable to the palate. And the children of Israel are in the wilderness for 40 years and every day they're given the same thing by God. They've baked it, they've boiled it, they've fried it, they've eaten it in every way that they have known and they are simply tired of having the same thing over and over. And of course, this would seem very natural to us. And yet God becomes so displeased by the fact that they are grumbling and complaining against him in what he has provided for them, and many of them die because of it. And so we're being told here, be not like them. Do not look upon the things of this world, set your heart toward them, and bicker and complain because you have to leave these things behind as his follower. 
Instead, be content in life with the simple things he has provided for you and be very careful in your attitude towards him in thinking that you have so much that you are missing out on of what the world has to offer because you as a follower of Jesus, as we have discussed, have been called to live a life of sacrifice. For if, as we are warned in verse 11 and 18, if we desire the things of this world and our hearts are set upon those things, we shall never enter into his rest. Because as he says in verse 12, pursuing the things of this world means that you are departing from the living God. To pursue the living God means that you are departing from the things of this world. The message is so clear in this text, and yet so many that call themselves his followers cannot distinguish the difference anymore because they are so much like this world, they have no idea of what holiness and separation from the world truly is all about. And that's more true today than ever with all that the world has to offer us. Well, we're going to close there today, friends. We'll pick up again tomorrow in chapter 4, verse 1. I trust that you are hearing the warning in the early part of this letter, and I trust that you are heeding the warning. Examine your hearts today, friends. Examine your life, for you owe it to yourself to be sure, absolutely sure, that you are being fit for the kingdom of God and that you have not been deceived by sin. Now, as he wills and until tomorrow, friends, I truly love you and I'll see you on the next video.